Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education Part 5, and this is Session 6A. And that means, yes, there is going to be a 6B. All right. So um, we've, we're in the godly uh, now because we finished up Chapter 14. As we get into Chapter 15, we're going to move from the godly living, and now we're going to get into the godly labor section of this. And so, as we always do to get ourselves started, let's read the whole section. This is going to run Romans 15, verse 1 to verse 7. So, let me pull this up on the PowerPoint, and here we go. Um, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but, as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we might through patience and comfort of the scriptures have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. All right, so the first part that we're going to do here is the first three verses. And this is going to give us that seventh feature of godly love. You've, we've done that acronym before, and you've actually got a note taker in your notes you know, we'll fill it in when we get over there. But let's just focus on these first three verses, so let's go back and read them. So here we are. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. It really does take all three of these verses to get that done. And so let's just look at this. In verse 1, there's the two issues of bearing the infirmity of the weak and not pleasing ourselves. I think that's pretty straightforward. Everybody gets that. In verse 2, there is the issue of the edification of another. That shouldn't be a surprise to us. We ought to be interested in the edification of other people. In verse 3, there is the example of Jesus Christ who gladly bore the reproach of his heavenly Father and did that for the glory of his heavenly Father. Now, when you put all three of those things together, when you put together bearing the infirmities of the weak, not pleasing ourselves, concerning ourselves to the edification of another, and the example of Christ, all right, so what do we have when we put all that together? Well, what we have is Jesus accomplishing the will of his heavenly Father by willingly bearing the reproach for the purpose of accomplishing his Father's will. Now, we're going to take a look at verse 3, and we're going to kind of unpack this a little bit because I want everyone to see this. So here it is. For even Christ pleased not himself. That's not a surprise. What did he just tell us? He just told us that, uh, we, should, um, uh, we should bear the infirmities of the weak and not please ourselves. And now here's Christ. Now, for even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproach of them that reproach thee fell on me. Where in the world is that written? Well, it's written in Psalm 69. Let's turn over there and take a look at it. Psalm 69, verse 9. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen on me. Now, there's two things to know about this, and I'm not going to go into a big dissertation on Psalm 69. First thing is, this is a messianic psalm. What does that mean? That means it is about the Lord Jesus as he functions as Israel's Messiah. There is also a component of this psalm which is about David, who wrote the psalm. But again, I don't want to get into Psalm 69. The only thing I'm after is to say, when Paul writes, as it is written... That's where it was written in Psalm 69. Now we're going to see this happen again in John's gospel. Take a look with me here in John chapter 2 beginning in verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money changers, uh, uh, I'm sorry, poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And the disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Well, that was the first part of Psalm 69. Now, what is the zeal for his father's house? That was what moved the Lord Jesus to do this very thing, to throw out the money changers and to drive them out of the temple. Now, his zeal was not just limited to the temple. What was he really after? He was after the accomplishment of his father's will of his father's purpose, and uh, of course to his father's glory. Those are the things that he was after. The zeal that was in the Lord Jesus for his father and all that he intended to do really did consume him. And that's what that means, that hath eaten him up. That, that zeal to accomplish all of those things that his father wanted was just burning within him like a fire. Now, the play on words, the zeal of my father's house. But you have to understand, yes, he was at the temple when that happened. But you have to understand that when you're talking about the house, you're not just talking about a physical building because what are we? what is Paul talking about when he's talking about over there? He's talking about Edification. When you're edified, when you're being edified, what's another way to describe that? Being built up. You're being built up in the faith. You're being edified. And that's and the root word of edification, edifice. Well, what is an edifice? An edifice is a building, right? So you're actually you're actually being built up in the faith. You're being edified. Now let me take you over to Corinthians real quickly and just show you this because it dovetails perfectly with this. It says in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. In other words, that's what God is interested in doing. I'm just trying to make that transition from the physical building of the temple, that it wasn't just about the temple, but it was really about the people. And um, so there's a companion scripture to this Romans 15 passage, and it's over in Philippians chapter 2. So as I was putting all this together, I thought, you know, I'm going to go ahead and include this. And this is the part that I was telling you in the previous session about the Lord Jesus making himself subservient for the purpose of accomplishing his father's will and glorifying his father. Remember, we picked this up back from the Ephesians 5.22 thing. So let's take a look at it in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, And if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And now the part that I'm after. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now how in the world is that a companion passage to what we're looking at here in Romans 15? It is because when Jesus as the Son, the second member of the Godhead, takes upon himself the form of a man, which is the form of a servant. He becomes obedient even unto death. That is part of a godly subordination. Remember, he is the second person of the Godhead. He is God. But he subordinated himself for the glory of God. And in the specific context of Romans 15, he provided for our edification by so doing. So you see, this wasn't just about how do I look when I do this, but it's what am I able to accomplish in this and how am I to benefit others? And so just look back to what, what Paul was saying there in those first two verses of chapter 15. So he took upon himself the form of a servant and that is part of the definition of what subordination is. So let me show you a couple of definitions. So back to the Oxford English Dictionary. Subservient means this is of use or servant as an instrument or means, serving as a means to further an end, object, purpose, or serviceable. That, so it's being of use or in service as an instrument to further an end. You know what? God the Father wanted something accomplished and the Lord Jesus was willing to be subservient so that that might be accomplished. Now, I'm not talking about subordination in just an attitude of humility, although humility is certainly a part of this, but it is a subordination with purpose behind it. In other words, it's not just, oh, I'm just being humble, but there's actually a reason to do this. There's something to be accomplished here. So godly subordination, which is something we might do as a part of our godly equity, godly subordination uh, is exactly the kind of meaning that we're talking about right here. So let me give you the Oxford English Dictionary on subordination. The condition, state, or fact of being subordinate or subservient, we just did that word, to a particular end, objective, or need. What did the Father want? He wanted him to take on the form of a man, to die as a man on the cross, so that he might redeem mankind. That is the particular end or objective that God had in mind. That was the Father's plan that was the father's purpose that was the father's will and so just to make sure we all understand that subordination here 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 is the subordinate that's just the the root part of that word it means dependent upon subservient to or secondary to some other chief or principal thing now so what does it mean to be subordinate in this context it means there is a feature of love that we're, that we're supposed to get out of this whereby we may willingly subordinate ourselves for the purpose of advancing the edification of another individual or of the assembly as a whole. That, and this would all be under the skill of godly equity here so that we could accomplish the Father's plan and purpose with the church. Now, that doesn't happen all the time. And certain circumstances have to arise in order for that to be the case. But I don't want to limit. So I'm trying to get a label here. Remember, I think I'm pretty sure that we, we did that, didn't we? There's those five core features of godly love, remember? And then, a couple of times back, we added a non-core feature, which was, I put an S on there, it was sacrificial love. In other words, we may have to limit our liberty in Christ for the good of a weaker brother. Okay, so that S, I didn't include the L, but that was sacrificial love. 
Now we're about to add the last core feature. And what I'm going to do, in fact, I, you know what? I should have this on, a, on, on the, the PowerPoint. So let me just, on, for your note taker. So here it is. So you can fill this in. It's the last part on your note taker that starts. I don't know what page that's on. But the scripture is Romans 15 verses 1 through 3. The context is the body of Christ. And the edifying result is purposed subordination. And I don't want to leave out that word purposed because that's, that tells us what, why we're doing what we're doing. See, it's not just out of humility, but there is something to be accomplished here. So I put a break in there so when we're doing our acronym, so that selfless... Loving kindness and tenderness. Remember, we did all of that. Well, when we get over to here, I, I broke it apart because P.S. That's just the way I thought about it. P.S. is what you put at the end of a letter when you have something to add. And I just put the P.S. at the end of the acronym because it was the last thing that we would add uh, that, would, that, that would kind of sum all of that up. And so there is that godly response, and that's part of godly equity. So let me just talk to you for a minute about what that subordination might entail. Just as there was an identification of the Lord Jesus with his heavenly Father, in what way? In every way. In other words, if someone thought good about the Father, they would be thinking good about him. But if they were thinking bad about the Father, he was so connected that they would also think badly about him. And that's the way that it ought to be. And that's the way it should be with us. Let me take you back to this verse again. And here it is. The reproaches of them that reproach thee, that father, fell on me. In other words, those people, heavenly father, that reproached you, those reproaches also fell on me because they saw us the same way. And, uh, and that identification was the same for both of those. Now, looking back at Romans chapter 14 and verse 3, there is an identification of the Son with the Father. And that means that the reproach of the... Uh, I just said it. The reproach that came against the Father also came against the Lord Jesus. Actually, not 14.3, 15.3. Sorry, wrong chapter. And so, it, the reproaches against His Father were the same as if they had been made against Him Himself. That is a feature of subordination. So if you're asking yourself, how in the world would we ever do that? When would that ever come into, come into play? Godly equity teaches us that there may come a time when we take on the reproach of another in order to advance their edification. That we would so identify with them. So if someone were to say to me, not knowing who I was, that group over there in Monaghan's, and then they have all these bad things to say, see, now I have a choice I can make. I can remain quiet, and they don't lump me in with that. Or I can actually admit to the fact that I'm the pastor. <laughs> and now everything that they thought about y'all, they would think about me. But it may go the other way, too. Whatever they think about me, they think about you. But the point is to say it's all wrapped up in a purposed subservience. Now, that's what I came up with. Does it have to be that term? No, of course not. But look, we saw that. I, I'm looking at all the things that are described, especially over in the Philippians 2 passage. And, you know, what we're looking at here is a, a humility. And, 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 um, and, and I, 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 I just think that purposed subservience is that part of godly equity that may come into play at some point in our life. And, um, you know, and Paul talks about this. I'm going to skip this next scripture in Philippians. You can read about it in the notes, but let's go to the Oxford English uh, Dictionary. There's the, a base means to lower in rank, condition, or character, to humble, humiliate, degrade. But look, the Lord Jesus became what he became and became identified with the Father in such a way that it was able to carry out the Father's purpose. And our flesh doesn't like to hear about this kind of a thing. When we read that definition, 
it's kind of like, gosh, can we take some of those things out of that because I don't really like that too much. But look, was the Lord Jesus ever humiliated? Well, absolutely, uh, he, he was. Uh, was he ever lied about by the religious leaders in Israel? Well, of course. Remember they said he cast out devils by the power of Beelzebub. Well, that wasn't true, but they, what did they do? They associated him uh, with the devil. Uh, was he humiliated when they mocked him and they put the crown of thorns on his head and, and then you, you know, uh, just made fun of him? How about when they put, made that circle around him and blindfolded him and took turns hitting him and said, oh, you're a prophet, prophesy who hit you. And then they spit on him and, you know, who spit on you? And, you know, tell us since you know it all. And was that humiliating? Was that degrading? Was that? But why would he go through that? Because there was something he was accomplishing. There was a purposed subservience that he, in, in his identification with his heavenly father, that allowed him to endure so much. In fact, Isaiah says that when they got through beating him in that circle, that his face no longer resembled the face of a man. These are things that we don't hear about a lot, but look, I'm just saying that we look at that and we think, oh, I don't want that. But the Lord really understood that he was in all the way and what it was that he was. And you know what the really amazing thing is? He was doing this for the very ones that were humiliating him, the very ones that were beating him. He was providing a salvation for any and all of them. So what else is in that purposeful, sub, sub, uh, uh, not submission, that's the word, subservience? What else is in there? Well, the Bible says he was reviled. Now, what does it mean to be reviled? Well, it means to be insulted and to be talked about in a very critical and abusive or angry or insulting manner to rail at. I have to be honest with you and tell you, and I think most men are probably, probably most people are this way. But the big thing, I, I've kind of learned this in my life. The big thing with women is, I mean, there's a lot of important things for all of us, but the big thing for a woman is, is she likes security. She likes to know that, you know, she has a place, a roof over her head. She likes to know that there's going to be, you know, food to eat. She likes to know those things. Men, I mean, I'm not saying we don't like or enjoy those things, but the big thing for men, the majority of the time, is to be respected. And, you know what, men can live in a cave, uh, but you don't want to make your wife do that, you know. Uh, you know, men can, you know, eat, you know, junk, but you don't want to make your wife do that. that those are important to her. But men, however, respect is a deal. It is that way with me. And so when I look at this reviled about being talked to in a, in a certain way, that, that kind of strikes at the core of who men are. Men don't like to be disrespected. And so this is another area where I don't like it. But you know what? There may have to come a time when because of a purpose that I'm trying to accomplish, I may have to endure those kinds of things. Um, and, I, and I just have to tell you, I, I mean, since I'm on this, I might as well just say it. Sometimes people, you know, uh, talk to each other in such vile ways because they're angry. And you should stop. I'm, I, mean, I mean, that should just stop. Um, I think it tears the very fabric of a relationship when you do those kinds of things. And so I'm, um, I'm, I'm trying to give you something here because I don't know anybody that's doing that here. There's just one family here. But, <laughs> but, but even the folks that are listening, I don't know of anybody that does that within this sphere. But in my life of ministry, I have seen plenty of times where that happen, and I... I can just tell you how hard it would be for me to endure that kind of relationship where someone would use that kind of language on me and speak to me that way and be, you know, so vile and disrespectful and, and, and those kinds of things. Those things would just cut me to the heart and uh, difficult to overcome. So when I see people that are able to do that and then... When they see each other 30 minutes later, they act like nothing ever happened and nobody ever addresses the elephant in the room. I just scratch my head and think, how does that happen? I, I don't understand that. But 
Anyway, the Lord Jesus subordinated himself to that kind of treatment. And I'm going to give you some verses to show that. So we're talking about being reviled. So here's the first one. Matthew 27, 39. And they that passed by reviled him. He's on the cross. They that passed by him reviled him, wagging their heads. It's a taunting, disrespectful gesture as they're being critical of him. The next one is in Mark 15, 32. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. So not only the people passing by are reviling him, but the criminals that are being crucified with him, they're reviling him. I mean, it's almost like how much lower can we go here that they're doing this? By the way, can, do, do you understand the, the, the sarcastic disrespect in that? Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. You know what the truth of the matter was? If he had of, they wouldn't have believed. They wouldn't have. But, but, that, but they're not doing it to really say, we'll believe if you do that. They're just doing that to, to reproach him. The last one I'll show you is 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23. Who, when he was reviled, this is Peter giving an account of that crucifixion event, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Well, who is that? That's the Father. Why was he submitting himself to all of this anyway? Because it was to accomplish his Father's will. It was accomplishing something that his Father wanted done. And so it was important to the Father, it was important to Him. And I saved the Apostle Paul's comment for last because I've been all over the place in that, but someone might say, well, I noticed you didn't have any quote from Paul about that. Well, I do. So here it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 12. And labor, this is Paul talking about himself, the things that have been happening to him. He says, and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. That's quite a bit different than the way we have been trained in our culture to respond to those things. If someone reviles us, we need to have a snappy comeback, see, that puts them in their place. That'll, that'll do it. But see, if you're after that, you're not really after them coming to Christ and so, or them as a Christian being, being edified. And, 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 and so... In all of those things, folks, that Paul is talking about there and that we saw in the Lord Jesus, there is a reward of the inheritance. And I'm not saying we ought to invent ways to suffer, certainly not. But look, and, and, we don't, and you don't need to create subordination when there is no call for it. So I'm not asking us, you know, to just uh, become the doormat uh, for everything that happens. But when that time arises and the edification of either someone within the body or of the body itself requires a purposeful subordination of ourselves, that is an aspect of love that we are supposed to manifest. Now let's go back and read those three verses now that we've worked our way through them. It says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. See, that's what's at the heart of that. And not to please ourselves. Because if we did that, we never would suffer those things. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Now, that's all the work that I'm going to do on those three verses. I, I think there is more that we could talk about, but you have gotten the gist of what that is so that this can... All you have to do now is go over that and look at that and do the work with your heavenly Father and get that working in you. Now we go to Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now I wrote in the notes that I pray this is happening for this assembly and that's why we go back like Paul does. He refers to things back in the Old Testament uh, and that's why we do that too. And I think, it, I think it does do what it's supposed to do. Now verse 5. 
Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I see, excuse me, I see these verses 5, 6, and 7 as a sonship checkpoint. And there's three issues we need to evaluate. The first issue is this. Paul says that God is the God of patience and consolation. So I would ask you this. Are we sons and daughters that have our Father's patience and consolation working in us? That's the first part of the checkpoint. Is what's in Him Our Heavenly Father is that in us. Or are we able to have those things working in us? Or to say it another way, is the patience and consolation of our Heavenly Father working in us toward our fellow members? That's that's the the conditions for that. So in order to make this assessment, we need to know what's being said when he says if we have patience and consolation. So if we keep in the overall context of this... In other words, it's this. So you have a weaker brother who comes in and this. Are you being patient with him? Now see, that's the context of this whole thing here. So are you allowing the edification to take place at the rate that is actually taking place? Now let me give you a dictionary de- definition for consolation. Okay, because we all know what patience is. Consolation. The act of consoling, cheering, or comforting. The state of being consoled, alleviation of sorrow, or mental distress. So this is not about going to a weaker brother and slapping him on the back and giving him the halftime pep talk. It's not about that, but it's about the the comfort that the scriptures give us being communicated to those that don't yet have those scriptures Uh, for themselves so are we using the doctrine to alleviate the sorrow of others and the mental distress that they go through has that doctrine begun to work in you so that becomes that this book becomes the resource for your consolation now I know that that is working in people here because I talk to folks here all the time And when you talk about someone that's gone through a really bad circumstance and and it's a hard thing for them, then do we think about the way to do this is not to give them worldly cliches, but to actually point them back toward the Scripture. And I know that this group does this. When Billy passed away, I got lots of cards and people wrote notes and they were all pointing me right back to the Scripture. So you know what that tells me? This group can pass that first checkpoint because that's, that's what's, that, what's there. Now let's look at the next part of the checkpoint. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one to another according to Christ Jesus. Now that being like-minded. Now how does our heaven... Now if we're going to be like-minded with our Heavenly Father, or according to Christ Jesus, we have to ask ourselves, how does He deal with tribulations? And how does He deal with worries? And how does He deal with fearful circumstances? Well, the same way that that happened with the Lord Jesus is the same way it happens with us. It's by God's Word working in our inner man to be able to endure those things without being overwhelmed by them. And if we're like-minded, it means that that is also the remedy that we will employ for each other. It truly is like father, like son. And so you notice that verse 5 only ends with a colon, not a period. That means that verse 6 is very closely connected with that. So let me bring that up where it says that. Now before I read the next part of the verse, I've highlighted the that because you know what he's doing here with the that? He is telling you the result of being like-minded with your heavenly Father. That, and now the ye, that ye, and that's a plural you in the Bible, Y-E is plural. The Y-O-U is when they're just talking to one person. So now everyone is being talked to here, 
And, uh, and that includes the babes. That includes the weaker brethren here. And it says, so now let me give you the rest of the verse. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. Now here's the result of being like-minded with God in this area of patience. Being patient with those who need to go through the edification process. And consolation. We deal with the sorrows that, that people are going through by pointing them back to the Word so that they're strengthened in their inner man. All of that concerns the edification of our fellow saints. And that's how you glorify God with one mind and one mouth. You understand? We're all saying the same kinds of things. So when someone's going through a difficulty, you know, if I were to look back through all those cards, I kept all those. But if I were to go back through all those cards and notes that were sent to me, you know what you'd find out? That even though some sometimes different verses were used, they were all really talking about the same thing. But someone did something out of Thessalonians, and someone did something out of Romans, and someone did something out of Corinthians. But what they were saying in all of that was always the same thing. You know what? That's speaking with one mind and one mouth. So the terminology here, I think, is pointing to more than just an individual edification but it's actually talking about the edification as a whole. And as the members do this, you know what we do? We begin to come together as a unit and function as a single body. You have to stop for a second and you have to think about that. At this point in our education, we should be able to do something. We should be able to, with one mind and one mouth, glorify God. It essentially says we all ought to be on the same page. We all ought to be thinking about this the same way. It means we all understand the same things. We're going to act out of that understanding. And when we encounter situations, we're going to deal with those situations in a common way among ourselves. So if it's just us, I would expect that the way I deal with things is the way the other folks in this group uh, would deal with those. Uh, and that is part of this, the decisions that we're making, how will they glorify God by producing an environment that is conducive to edification of every single member and of the body as a whole. And the things that we're doing are the very same things that our father would be doing if he was in our shoes. Okay, so this doctrine of equity is important when you realize that God is trying to accomplish all of this and along with this, realize that Satan is at work trying to disrupt this process. He is trying to cause strife and division and contention among the members so that this kind of edification cannot really take place. He is trying to keep us from being what an assembly is supposed to be. So when churches are meeting together, you know, it's amazing to me. Meet together for for 30 years, they've been in church together, and they fight, and they squabble, and they don't like this group, doesn't like that group, and we don't have anything to do with that group, and we got our little group here. You know, Satan is perfectly happy for them to keep meeting and doing whatever it is they do, because they're not becoming what it is that, he, that God actually created the local church to become. So at the heart of this checkpoint is how we value and esteem the edification of every member and also how committed we are to being transformed by the doctrine that Paul is writing about in his epistles. Now I do have one more thing to say about the one mouth issue. Again, keeping to this context of edification, this refers to the ability of the whole assembly to understand what we're engaged in and to be able to articulate that. One mouth. In other words, we can say to someone, what is it we are doing and why that is important? What is it we're trying to accomplish here? And actually, I think we should have been able to do that sometime back. So in order, because I knew this was happening, I thought, you know, what would really be good? And I, I think folks have kind of done this, but everybody kind of has a little bit of a different flavor of how to do it and I thought you know it'd really be good if we could 
put together a very succinct way of describing sonship. Because that's what happens. When people hear that term, they don't really know what's involved in that. So I've actually been talking to some of the folks that are out in Zoom land about helping me get together that. I, we did some work on that, and then I got extremely busy, and I fell off the radar. And uh, they're probably wondering what happened to me. But anyway, uh, I want to get back to that so that by the time we get to graduation, we can actually put that together in a way where you can say that in a very succinct and, and inclusive way of describing how to do that. But I think everybody can do that. They just won't all be using the exact same terminology to do it. And that's fine. But God's glorified when we understand the process whereby we are edified and when we engage in that process. And that is when the life of God's Son is formed in our inner man. That is how we are edified unto godliness. That is how we are transformed by the doctrine. All this terminology, that's how we're conformed to the image of God's Son. I mean, that's how our Father's wisdom is installed in our inner man. That's how the doctrine effectually works in us. All these different ways of saying that, when we engage in that, that's how God is glorified. So it all still points back to edification. Okay, so that's the end of this session.